Light MH370. And then in the southern Indian Ocean. Madam Speaker, we mourn all those 239 passengers and crew. There are no words which can ease that pain. People want answers to what's happened. Um, you know, no, everyone's going to want closure. MRC and MRC images and in one area of the ocean measuring some 400 square kilometers, we're able to identify 122 potential objects. It's 18 days since Malaysian Airlines Flight MH370 disappeared on its fateful journey from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. And after 24 hours grounded by the weather, the international search fleet resumed its mission by air and at sea. As 12 planes and five ships combed the southern Indian Ocean southwest of Australia, satellite images yielded another potential clue in the hunt. Yesterday, on the 25th of March, the Malaysian Remote Sensing Agency, MRSA, received new satellite images from Airbus Defence and Space, which is based in France, and these images were taken on the 23rd of March. MRSA analysed the images, and in one area of the ocean measuring some 400 square kilometres, were able to identify 122 potential objects. Some objects were a meter in length, others were as much as 23 meters in length. Some of the objects appeared to be bright, possibly indicating solid material. These new images, to the untrained eye little more than flecks barely visible between the clouds, may prove the most important sighting yet. They follow previous notable satellite images that have, over time, help narrow the boundaries of a vast search area. The search of the southern Indian Ocean began over a week ago, on March the 18th. Day by day, it has been refined as aircraft have crisscrossed the ocean. Today, it focused on these areas in the south of the search zone. Now, attention turns to the new potential debris field here. It's close to the area of previous sightings from Chinese and Australian aircraft. During the weather delay, the search team has grown. Japanese and Chinese planes and ships have joined the effort, suspending regional differences to work together. The search is being coordinated by Australia. The sky's James Matthews has joined one of the aircrafts at the heart of the recovery effort. Well, I'm in the cockpit of an Australian Orion P3 being flown by Flying Officer Captain Peter Moore and 11 Squadron Crew 3. Take a look at this cockpit. Normally not as busy as it is right now. Normally three people in here. There are five sets of eyes looking around, scanning the vista. What this aircraft is doing, it's one of a dozen in use today. This is flying in a series of straight lines effectively, up and down a grid covering 900 square miles in the search for the, the debris, the remnants of MH370. Two of the search stores that we carry on the aircraft, we have a passive sonar buoy. Um, the idea of this, for this sort of mission, we fire this out of the aircraft. Uh, we can use it to mark a position because it actually sends out an RF signal that other aircraft can home to. Um, but it also, it has a hydrophone set up, long cable, we can set this at different depths. Um, we're going quite deep because the water out here is extremely deep and these things have a drogue chute on them so they're affected more by the, the drift in the ocean so it's the water drift so when we're looking for submerged debris this sort of thing will have the same sort of drift rates as what the debris will have 
so we'll give us a better idea. The other search tool we use is the uh, Sardatum boy. So these are the same thing, they have a UHF uplink, other aircraft and search assets can home to them. Um, we free fall these out of the aircraft and uh, these are affected more by wind. So if we're looking for people in the water, this is the sort of thing that we'll drop because they tend to match the way a human being will drift in the water as opposed to debris which we use as sort of voids for. Well now we're a bit further back on this plane at the navigation, communication and tactical stations. You can see it's still very much eyes on through the domed window looking down from a height of around 700 feet. We have been down to 650 and as high as 800. Some other aircraft go as low as 200 feet. But this crew uh, have found during four sorties that 700 feet works for them, gives them a, an appropriate visual cone from that height where they can look down and they have a, a reasonable sized vista to scan the surface and just beneath the surface. Let me show you something interesting. If you look this way, this engine, this plane has four engines, four propeller engines. One has been switched off to maximize the amount of time it can stay in the search area by saving fuel. This Orion is just one of the assets in the multinational search team. Sky's David Bowden and our experts look at how they work together. We can see how they work in the search zones. They're making sure that no part of this vast area is missed as they hunt for this wreckage, which may vary in size from many metres to tiny, smallish chunks. How difficult is it to get hold of the smaller pieces and put them together and realise that this is all part of the same plane, given that we know there's lots of junk in this ocean as well? Yeah, there's not likely to be a typical aircraft accident into the water. There's not likely to be a very high proportion of the stuff that floats. So they're, they're going to have random bits, a lot of composite structure, plastic structure. Um, so it's not going to be possible to put that stuff together. Um, I mean, you would clearly look for interesting features on it, such as burning, which might suggest an in-flight fire or blast damage, high explosives. But presumably the key to all of this is this is all well and good, but until somebody gets a chunk, any chunk, onto a ship, analyses it and says, yes, this is MH370, we're still in the dark, it could be anything. Yes, exactly, yes, yes. And the main value of it, as David says, will be tracking back to try to discover where stuff is on the seabed. And how does the search pattern actually work? I mean, do the planes and the ships just do their own thing? Or do we have planes going in one direction, ships in the other, almost like a grid sequence? I, I don't know the details of it. The normal thing would be a, a sort of lawnmower pattern mowing, mowing the grass. So just backwards and forwards, either on the surface or in the air. And presumably that is to ensure in this vast ocean that we don't miss an entire corridor where all the plane is. Yeah, that's right. And it's relatively simple to do that these days with a global positioning system. OK, well, let's have a look at some of the assets that are involved in this. We've talked about ships and planes. We've got HMS AS Success. That's the Australian Navy ship. That's been there coming one of what we now know are two main search areas. The other half of the seaborne effort at the moment is a Chinese ship. Um, HMS Echo is also on her way. She's been refuelling in the Maldives. She's part of the Navy's survey flotilla. And there's a detector, an American towed pinga locator, an instrument that can help find a black box. That system will be fitted onto a ship and it will be towed out into the search area. And there's also this robotic mini sub called the Bluefin. Now that can go all the way down to four and a half thousand meters and examine in detail what's going on below the ocean. The sun set on another fruitless day at sea with the families of the 239 passengers and crew no closer to understanding how and why flight MH370 crashed. Anger at the official response saw them take to the streets in Beijing on Tuesday. They marched on the Malaysian embassy target for the frustration and grievance of the bereaved. Today, they got a response. A delegation from Malaysia flew in to brief the families. Come on. 35,000 feet. 
range 3,375 cumulative miles at the 40 degree arc. They're grieving in Australia too. Madam Speaker, we mourn all those 239 passengers and crew. Australia will do all it can to recover what we can from the southern Indian Ocean so that they can have the closure and eventually the peace that comes with understanding more of what happened. It was another reminder that, above all, the search for Flight MH370 is about people. In part two, we look at the human cost of the tragedy and the technology involved in the recovery effort. Flight MH370 ended in the southern Indian Ocean. Madam Speaker, we mourn all those 239 passengers and crew. There are no words which can ease that pain. People want answers to what's happened. Um, you know, no, everyone's going to want closure. MRSA analyzed the images and in one area of the ocean measuring some 400 square kilometers were able to identify 122 potential objects. Today's developments, with now four satellite images to work from, have narrowed the search area in the southern Indian Ocean. Sky's David Bowden has analysis from the Situation Room. If we zoom into that search area, 1,500 miles or so southwest of Perth in the southern Indian Ocean, the search for MH370 resumed this morning after gale force winds and heavy swells suspended it yesterday. And as you can see by the colours marked on here, these are the areas that have already been searched starting all the way back to March the 18th. Today we've got 12 aircraft joining the search, 7 military and 5 civil planes together with a number of ships. Now the search area has now been condensed to 50,000 square miles. It's still huge but it's getting more clearly defined every day and by the time they reach the site, the aircraft only have enough fuel for about two hours of search time before they need to go back to Perth. So that's the search area, that's what's going on, gentlemen. As experienced investigators and analysts of this, Tony, do you feel that they're zoning in now on the real deal? This is debris from the plane. It's starting to look by, like it, but uh, there's not going to be a definite until some of that wreckage is retrieved and um, is identified as being part of the 777. Because we've heard that a, a French satellite has found what might be a fairly contained debris field with hundreds uh, of articles in it, but it's all over an area of about 160 square miles, which sounds a lot, but in this ocean is actually quite tight. Yes, I mean, uh, debris released from an aircraft hitting the water is, is going to disperse naturally because it will be differently affected by the wind and the current depending on how high it's floating above the surface. So things will disperse a bit, even if they start off in the same place. David, just let me ask you as a sort of overview, um, how do you view the way the search is going now? Do you think this is the beginning of the end game and they are going to come up with the real deal here? Well I think uh, it, it does point towards us having located the debris field, hopefully that's the case, um, and then the search will get more refined on that debris field 
but then of course it'll have to expand because that debris field will have floated for some considerable distance uh, and so then we have to work back and find the, the initial uh, impact point and, and hopefully find the flight data recorders there. But, so we could be seeing a widening of that search area again after that. All right, well, we'll pause it there for now. Let's have a look at who's doing what as far as the search is concerned. We've got six countries assisting the search and rescue operation at the moment. There's a New Zealand Air Force P-3 Orion that's been over the area. Australia's also got two of its own P-3s in the search. And the largest ship in the area, HMAS Success. There's a Chinese aircraft and four Chinese ships also in the search area already. And the United States Navy have got their P-8 Poseidon submarine detector also in there. There are P-3 Orions from Japan and South Korea as well. And five civil aircraft also part of the search with volunteers on board to act as lookouts. So finally, gentlemen, it looks as though we're getting all the resource necessary to make this happen. They're saturating the area both from the sky and on the sea, and presumably it's only a matter of time. But if I talk to you, David, we were speaking last week about data recorders. The clock is ticking big time on this because it's only got 30 days and we're, what, 17, 18 days into it now? Absolutely. Uh, the race is on to, to find those. The, the pinger on the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder should last at least 30 days, so we may have a little bit more time than that. So, uh, but certainly the effort will be to get equipment down there that can actually hear the pings that the flight data recorders will be sending out. The challenge now is to locate that flight data recorder under the ocean. It calls for a highly specialised, skilled operation. You really need to be very, very close to that acoustic pinger to be able to hear it. Um, to give you an example, if we're talking 4,000 meters of water, you know, you can't be on the surface and hear it. You need to be, you know, a few hundred meters away and possibly, you know, a few hundred meters to either side. No more than 1,500, 2,000 meters. Beyond that, you probably won't hear it. Sky's Amanda Walker has more on the underwater technology that will be deployed. If anything can find flight MH370's black box, it's this. A state-of-the-art hydrophone deployed with the US Navy to help solve the agonizing mystery. This is the crucial noise that everyone wants it to detect. The pings emitted by a black box. We are very optimistic that the equipment can do the work. It just depends on how much time we have to do it. Bad weather makes the operation go much, much longer. The depths should not be a problem here. The topography should not be a problem. It can track the pings made by a data recorder from up to around four miles underwater. Flight MH370's pings are expected to fall silent in around two weeks time. The pinger has approximately a 30 day battery life. It's like if you have a flashlight and you keep it on, it'll slowly get dimmer and dimmer until it won't come on anymore. It's the same with the pinger. But if time does run out, all might not be lost. Phoenix International assisted with the recovery effort of the Air France plane that went down in the Atlantic five years ago. The black box ping was never heard, but this equipment helped them find it anyway. This remotely operated vehicle can function up to four miles down. It's equipped with lights, sonar and cameras, and it's those arms that would ultimately recover a black box. But no one is doubting the mammoth scale of this task. The authorities know how many hopes are pinned to this technology and the chance that it could lead to at least some answers that so many are so desperately seeking. The question of why the aircraft went down is still unanswered and may prove as challenging as the search. Early suspicion fell on the flight's captain, 53-year-old Zahari Ahmad Shah. He's a vastly experienced pilot with more than 18 and a half thousand flying hours under his belt. The first officer was Farik Abdul Hamid, 27, and joined Malaysian Airlines in 2007. He was fairly new to this model of aircraft, a Boeing 777-200. This CCTV shows the two men going through security on their way to board the flight that evening. 
We're told they did not specifically request to fly together. Police have started searching their homes, talking to friends and neighbours. They found this flight simulator in Captain Zahari's house. Investigators say that some data on it has been deleted. Could the flight manifest hold the answers? Investigators are scrutinising all 239 names. More than two weeks after the plane's disappearance, we're still learning more about the men, women and children who were on board this flight. Chandrika Sharma was heading to Mongolia via Beijing to attend a United Nations meeting on food and agriculture. Her husband and daughter are inconsolable. The youngest passenger on the flight was two years old, the oldest, 76. Seven of them were children who will never reach their fifth birthdays. 26-year-old Yu Wen Chao is originally from Mongolia. He moved to study business at Hull University in England. He'd gone home to see his girlfriend. Muktesh Mukherjee and his wife, Zai Mao Bai, had been on a beach holiday together in Vietnam. Their two young sons were waiting for them at home. 15 different nationalities were flying to Beijing that night. Among them, 153 from China, 38 from Malaysia, 5 Indians, 4 French, 3 from the United States. Two Iranians on board became initial suspects, but seemed to have been ruled out. 35-year-old Ju Kun is a stuntman who was due to start work on a new series for Netflix in Malaysia next week. He was on his way to Beijing to see his two children. Bob and Kathy Lawton are from Springfield Lakes in Australia. They have three daughters who are described as doting grandparents. Paul Weeks is a mechanical engineer. He accidentally left his wedding ring and watch behind him at home when he travelled to Mongolia for work. Hadrian Watrelos, on the right, is 17. Zhao Yan, on the left, 18. They were on their way to school in Beijing. At every turn, the mystery of MH370 has defied simple explanation. The hope for all the search crews at work over these vast expanses of ocean is that they can recover pieces of the lost plane and finally provide proof of its fate for the waiting relatives. What we're trying to do is, is at least provide uh, evidence of where um, the aircraft, uh, aircraft may have gone down um, and by, by, by purely doing that we're, we're providing at least some, some closure to the, uh, to the family and friends of those on board. For the grieving families, it can't come soon enough.